thank you, Nick, for the introduction. Um, I'm excited to talk with you about Virtual Chip C, uh, which is a method for predicting transcript and factor binding sites. Uh, but first of all, uh, I motivate you on why we want to predict transcript and factor binding sites. We have Chip C, which is the invisible site for identifying genome wide binding sites of the transcript and factor that you're interested in, and you have a good antibody for it. Um, the problem with Chip C, uh, at least one of them, is that it requires millions of cells. So let's say if you just want to study a few transcription factors in very particular type of disease or cancer system, that you have limited amount of issue, you won't be able to do this for all the transcription factors that you're interested in. And, but there are other assays such as RNA-seq, which relies on, which can give you genome-wide uh, gene expression data, uh, and DNA-seq or attack-seq, which can give you chromatin accessibility, and we want to use these uh, types of information to predict transcription factor binding. There are other people who have done uh, this to predict transcription factor binding sites, and mainly these methods use two types of data: chromatin accessibility, which is a very good predictor of transcription factor binding, and our knowledge that many transcription factors are sequence specific. So many of these methods uh, that you see are highlighted here are site-centric, meaning that they scan the genome to find match to particular sequence motifs and then prioritize these uh, sequence matches by some other criteria. There are other unsupervised methods where segment the genome uh, and try to find regions that are bound to transcription factor. One of them is HINT, uh, which uses a hidden Markov model and it scans the genome by chromatin accessibility signal and tries to find regions where shape of the chromatin accessibility signal represents transcription factor binding. In this case, you see that in the place where you have the transcription factor, you couldn't get sequence read, so this seems to be a shape of the factor. So after finding these regions, these methods again rely on sequence motifs. So they search databases like Jasper, where we know uh, of transcription factor sequence references, and then uh, predict which transcription factor is found there based on these data. The problem with these methods that have a very uh, major focus on uh, sequence preference is that there are too many matches uh, in the genome for each sequence motif than the actual number of binding sites. So if you pick a sequence motif, you scan the genome, you identify hundreds of thousands to millions of matches, but in reality, the number of peaks that you get from an vivo assay such as ChipSeq is in the order of hundreds of thousands. In addition to that, we know that uh, many uh, transcription factor binding sites don't have the sequence motif. So here, we are looking at uh, 204 transcription factors in the ENCODE data uh, that are shown on the x-axis. And on the y-axis, we have percent of binding sites of each transcription factors that have the sequence motif. So on top, the red factors, uh, you see that the value is zero, meaning that in Jasper database, we didn't have any sequence motif presenting these factors. So these are uh, among the hundreds of factors that are not sequence specific. For the transcription factors that are sequences specific, this range varies from 5 to 90% based on the factor. So in addition to the false positives uh, that we talked about, there's also too many false negatives um, that uh, you would get if you rely on methods that mainly focus on sequence preference. Uh, so the main idea that we have here is to uh, use direct evidence of transcription factor binding from publicly available cheap seek data and also learn the association between gene expression and transcription factor binding. So here, for example, we are just looking at one hypothetical factor. When we look at uh, cheap seq data, I'm just showing a small genomic region here. We identify peaks, which are uh, the blue boxes, and we identify summit of the peak, which the peak calling software thinks is the center of transcription factor binding. What we do here is to map these to genomic bins based on the signal value that we observe and create this matrix of cell type versus genomic bin. I'm just showing a few genomic regions here, uh, but you can do this for any genomic region that has transcription factor binding in at least one cell. Then we look at gene expression data. In this case, hypothetical gene A has a very good correlation with hypothetical genomic region uh, 2 from top in this matrix. And then we look at the whole genome, we identify many genes that have positive or negative association with transcription factor binding. Now let's 
take a look at some real data. Basically, what we do here is to uh, identify cell types that for each transcription factor have matched chip seed and RNA seed data. Uh, we use the gene expression data and identify 5,000 genes that have the highest variance among the matched cell types. And here I'm just showing a hundred of these uh, to show you the variance that we observe based on where the, these genes are from. And we also create the ChIP-seq matrix on the left. And we create an association matrix, which is basically a pairwise correlation between any pair of gene and genomic region. And in many cases, of course, we uh, would see that there is no significant association. So we use a free value value of 0.1, uh, and we represent these as missing values. So when we want to predict finding a new cell type, we wouldn't rely on associations that don't pass our cutoff. So then, uh, when we get the expression of a new cell type that wasn't in my previous training cell types, uh, we would uh, calculate the Spearman correlation for uh, the expression of genes in my new cell type and the, every single row of the association matrix that I talked about. So the y-axis here is just one row from the association matrix. I repeat this for every single uh, association matrix. And when I look at actual uh, data from GM pilot 7 8 uh, gene expression, there seems to be a positive association. In this cherry pick case, there is actually a transcription factor binding for this genomic region in GM 1 8 7 8 where I had a positive association, but not for K562, where I had a negative association. In addition to this, I use other features in my model uh, that are previously known to be associated with transcription factor binding. These include genomic conservation, chromatin accessibility, number of cell types with pre transcription factor binding according to public data, and also sequence motifs. Our aim here is to build one, to train one model that works well on any new cell type, irrespective of uh, if it's cancer or cell line or tissue. And trying to do that, what we do is to create a matrix that is a combination of data from multiple cell types. And the features that we use, some of them are specific to the genomic region, and some such as expression score and chromatin accessibility are from the two inputs that are specific to the new cell. I use a multi-layer perceptron, which is a fully connected artificial neural network. Basically what happens here is that for each genomic region, I have several features. Genomic conservation, chromatin accessibility, etc. And what happens in the multi-layer perceptron here is that each uh, neuron in each layer decides to leverage uh, different types of features uh, differently. And at the end, it looks at the final output, which is the cheap stick data, which we have as the gold standard here, and tries to optimize its parameters to somehow give us a number between 0 and 1, which would be the likelihood of transcription factor binding at that genomic region. There are many hyperparameters that we have to define as when uh, designing the architecture, and we do this by four-fold cross-validation using data of just four chromosomes to uh, limit uh, the computation. To assess performance of a binary classifier, there are uh, many uh, methods, and many uh, two important metrics are threshold independent, meaning that you don't have to decide on a cutoff between zero and one to get the true positives, false positives. You do this for every single number between 0 and 1, and you create this line. For a random classifier, for ROC plot, you would expect an area of 0 0.5, but for precision recall, the area would be 0. So what's the point of that, using two metrics? Uh, here we have an imbalanced data set, where the actual number of transcription factor binding sites um, is very limited. So most genomic regions that you test don't have the binding. In this case, you think that EZH2 and JUNDI have a very similar performance, but when we look at uh, precision recall curve, that's actually not the case. In addition to threshold independent uh, met metrics, we use Matthews correlation coefficient, which is uh, dependent on an actual threshold, and it's a very good metric for imbalanced data set and can reflect the differences of classifiers. So at the end, we train on 13 training cell types, uh, we validate the model on five cell types, uh, and we see a range of area under precision recall. Uh, for transcription factors that you see a sequence motif beneath the plot here, these are actually sequence-specific factors. And 
you see that for some transcription factors that don't have the sequence motif and other methods wouldn't be able to predict binding for them, we actually have a very high uh, accuracy. So, and now we are also taking a look at area under a receiver operating characteristic curve and matrix correlation coefficient. For 36 factors, MCC is more than 0 0.3, and in terms of actual true positives, what it translates to is that for almost all these factors, when uh, we predict there is no binding, 99% of the time they're correct. But when we predict there is binding, based on uh, the value here, for example, for SMC3, it's around 75% of the times that we're correct. And here we are looking at our actual true predictions uh, in K562, which was one of our validation cell types. And we are looking to see if the model was able to identify some regions that are bound to the transcription factor, but lack some important predictive features of blindness. So for uh, everything that has this blue bar from uh, that is on the top, meaning that it means that 100% of the truly predicted binding sites didn't have the sequence emoji. What's interesting here is uh, this red and purple <coughs> and green uh, bars here, meaning that it, it could predict true binding sites that uh, were not conserved, uh, didn't uh, have overlapped chromatin accessible regions, or didn't have a uh, transcription factor binding in any of the training cell types. Meaning the model is able to leverage different factor information to predict novel uh, binding. And uh, what we do next is we look at the roadmap data uh, where we have DNA seq and RNA seq on many human, uh, adult, and embryonic tissues. And for 34 of these tissues, which we had matched DNA seq and RNA seq, we predicted binding for the 36 factors that we had a uh, Matthews correlation coefficient of more than 0.3. And uh, we will provide these as a public level resource that can help us uh, study the non coding genome. The future aim here would be to use a model that um, can um, leverage the information of upstream and downstream positions. So the model that we have here is now is very simple. Uh, each genomic region is treated independent of all the other genomic regions. But um, we can imagine a scenario that chromatin accessibility or binding in upstream regions can affect downstream regions. So we, have, uh, we are looking to improve the model by looking at um, architectures that allow this type of um, dependency, such as every parent all So in summary, we use a multilayer perceptron uh, and previous evidence of transcription factor binding, chromatin accessibility, and gene expression to uh, predict uh, transcription factor binding. And for 36 factors that we've had an MCC of more than 0.3, we will provide the uh, predictions as a resource on roadmap data. With that, I would like to uh, thank my supervisor, Michael Hoffman, as well as all the other members of the Hoffman Lab, uh, many other people that are mentioned or even not mentioned here, and the funding agencies. I'll be happy to take any questions. Great, thanks, Niran. Uh, we have time for a couple of questions. Uh, what was the reason why you used a neural net? It seems like you only have a handful of features. What happened if you see something simple like a random forest? Um, that's a very good question. Uh, actually, we tried um, several other uh, classifiers, such as support vector classifier, um, several ensemble classifiers like random forest. And overall, the multilayer perceptron uh, had a, a much better performance. And the other, it's true that the number of features is limited. But the number of samples and the complexity of data is uh, very complicated. So when I just use four chromosomes for training, this is 9,600,000 genomic bins that we can use, uh, but a limited to a smaller number. Uh, but in summary, it's basically the complexity of data that the multilayer perceptron works better. I guess there's a similar question on the left side, like how many hidden units and layers did you find were optimal? And that's a, a good question. So uh, we did we trained the model once per transcription factor, and uh, we searched several different hyperparameters for the number of hidden layers and neurons. So for hidden um, and neurons, the number was uh, for most transcription factors was 100, and the number of hidden uh, layers was between uh, 10 to 50. Uh, but there were some cases where, uh, as we increased the layers from uh, five, there wasn't any improvement. 
Okay, great. Let's thank Miranda again. Thank you.